Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. Okay, so I think it's important for the first observation to be the answer choices. That's where we should always start for problem solving questions. Just a quick glance to see what the uh, what hints we might be able to pick up from the answer choices. And in this case, I can see, I can tell that it's a ratio question because uh, we're not talking about uh, actual numbers here. We're talking about a percent increase or decrease. So if there are any actual numbers in the question stem, those are not going to be my focus. I might need to use them to infer some ratios, but that's not the focus. Okay, so I start reading the question. And where do you think I would take my first long pause? Precisely, I'll stop at the word and, and think about it for a bit. Who here can come up with a real life example where something is directly proportional to the square of something else and come up with a real life example. That's right. The area of a square is directly proportional to the square of any of the lengths, whether it's the side of the square or the diagonal of the square or the uh, perimeter of the square. The area of the square is going to be directly proportional to the square of any of the lengths. An area is always going to be directly proportional to the square of the one-dimensional ratio. If you take a square and then you triple the length of its diagonal, would that triple the area of the square? If it was directly proportional, then it would triple the area of the square, right? You triple the diagonal, you triple the area. So why are we not just saying directly proportional? Because it's wrong, because it's not correct. If you triple the length of the diagonal of a square, the area of the square would get multiplied by a factor of three squared. What about the volume of a cylinder? Let's see if I can draw this. I'm not the best at uh, art, but let's pretend that I did a great job drawing a cylinder here. Isn't it true that the volume of this cylinder is directly proportional to the square of the radius. No, cube. Cube of the radius. Because the volume is a three, it's the, the, it's the raised to the power three. Mm -hmm. By r squared h mm -hmm. has to be cubed. But notice that you said pi r squared, not pi r cubed. Mm -hmm. If the height remains the same and we double the mm -hmm. radius, what will happen to the volume? Yeah, it'll get uh, squared. It'll get multiplied by 2 squared. And if we triple mm -hmm. the radius, volume will get multiplied by 3 squared. And if we multiply the radius by 5, volume will get multiplied by 5 squared. So all we're doing so far is trying to better understand what this language means. Directly proportional to the square of something. When we talk about like, proportionality, we're not talking about the actual measurement of anything. We're talking about the change factor of that measurement. We're, what we're interested in is the factor by which it is changing. It is getting multiplied. So what you should have said is not the chemical, not concentration of chemical A is 2, but rather concentration of chemical A is doubled, meaning it's getting a factor, a change factor of 2. Then you would say that the uh, certain chemical reaction gets multiplied by a change factor of 2 squared. Why squared? Because of the square here. Does that make sense? Does anyone here happen to know the formula for BMI? BMI is short for body mass index. Anybody know the formula? Why am I thinking of BMI when I read this question? I think the taller you are, the less likely you are going to be overweight. Or the heavier you are, the more likely you're going to be overweight. Proportional. Proportionally, that's right. And the reason I thought of BMI is because of the fact that we have a square. 
So if my weight stays the same, but I double my height, I don't know how one doubles his height unless he's uh, growing from age uh, 4 to age 14. <laughs> but theoretically, if I could double my height, my BMI would get divided by 4. I would get a quarter of my previous BMI. So this is all about change factors, the factors by which something is changing. And we have, from the chapter on uh, multiplicative stories, we have a kind of a format, right, a table that we can fill in for such circumstances. Chemical reaction, and what do we know? That it's directly proportional to the square of chemical A. So let's just call it A. So whatever that is gets squared. And it's inversely proportional to the concentration of chemical B. So for B, I'm going to have to take the reciprocal of whatever the change factor is. And that's going to give me the change factor for uh, the chemical reaction. So these are just change factors. So now we're getting to the actual changes, what's happening here. If the concentration of chemical B is increased by 100%. Okay, so unfortunately for us, they didn't present the information in the format of a change factor. They presented it as a percent change. We're going to have to do a little translation here from percent change to change factor. Now, I think for some of you, you probably just know that a 100% increase means you're doubling. But if you didn't know, or if you just want to have more flexibility and know how to use, uh, how to work with other percent changes, I think the easiest thing to do is to just build a ratio and say, if my starting point was 100, and I'll always use 100 as my starting point when we're dealing with percent change, just because percent is out of 100, so that's a good starting point to use. If I increase that by 100, that takes me to 200. So if I started from 100, and then I had a 100% increase, I go to 200, and the change factor is just the end point over the starting point. So that's my change factor. It's a change factor of two, and that goes, they're talking about chemical B, so that goes in here. That's a change factor for B. And then I keep reading. Which of the following is closest to the percent change in the concentration of chemical A required to keep the reaction rate unchanged? So actually, my question mark shouldn't go there. My question mark should go here. This is what they're asking for. And what will go on the right-hand side under chemical reaction? That's right, remaining unchanged, meaning a change factor of 1, multiplying by 1. So we are trying to figure out what squared times half equals 1. If you like, you can multiply both sides of the equation by a factor of 2. So you'd get question mark squared equals 2. And then if you've memorized the square root of 2, you'll know that the question mark is approximately 1.4. One of the tricks people use to memorize this is Valentine's Day, 214. The square root of 2 is approximately 1.4. And they use St. Patrick's Whoa. Day for the square root of 3. The square root of 3 is 1.7, so 317, St. Patrick's Day. So if you're... Uh, if you live in a nation that celebrates Valentine's Day and St. Patrick's Day, then you can use those tricks to help you memorize the square roots. So are we done? We know now that for chemical A, there is a change factor of approximately 1.4. Oh man, they're asking it for it as a percent change. So we have to do one more translation now, this time in the opposite direction, going from change factor to percent change. So what's the method for that? Again, I'll use 100 as my starting point. I always do that for percents. So 100. I have a change factor of approximately 1.4, which gets me to approximately 140. So if my starting point was 100 and I ended up at 140, that translates into a 40% increase. How do you know A and B are related to each other in, in, the, in the question? Because when I was doing it, I actually thought A and B were in completely separate universes. Got it. And 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 the example I say is say distance. We know that it's proportional to time. 
But there is another. There are other distance formulas like work and force. Yeah. And it's also inversely proportional to force. Now you wouldn't say time and force would be in the same universe. It doesn't make sense to say something like that. That's where I struggle. How do you know A and B are connected to each other? If we know that A equals C, and we also know that B equals C, we can then infer that A equals B, and that's called the transitive property. So we would then say that. Uh, this kind of operation, the equal sign, is a transitive operation. Right? If A equals mm -hmm. C and B also equals C, then A equals B. And that's what's going on with the proportionality. If we know that the rate of a certain chemical reaction is uh, directly proportional to the square of A and inversely proportional to the square of B, then A and B must have some kind of uh, relationship to one another. Now, to your point about, hey, there are different ways to um, to find out distance that, that are from, coming from different universes. Yeah, that may be true, but we are then told, as we continue to read the question, what are the words here that uh, make me so confident that they're related to one another? It's this. I mean, all of this text that I have highlighted here in green implies that let me narrow this down a bit, the highlighting. Yeah, basically the, the whole thing becomes nonsensical if, uh, if, if, you, if it wasn't that way. And, uh, and I think the word required really is the key word here. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.